Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you, sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. And studying the purification rites of the Jewish woman, after she gives birth, how she can once again become clean, ceremonially clean, so that she can enter back into worship. But as I spent time studying this, I learned that I already knew, man, this is so important for us. There is so much good stuff in this chapter, guys. So what started off for me is like dreading it. I got all excited, all fired up on it. And it is just rich. It is just rich. So hang on to your hats. We've got some rich stuff coming on as we get into Leviticus chapter 12. Now, those of you that have been here for the past two weeks, you know that we were in Leviticus 11 the past two weeks. And there we saw the, con the contamination, the uncleanness, the ritual uncleanness that would happen to any child of God in the nation of Israel when he would touch something that God had deemed to be unclean. It was contamination by contact, so to speak. And we saw that if you ate certain animals that God said don't eat, you ate them, you were ceremonially unclean. If you touch certain animals, you were ceremonially unclean. And we, we took a look at that in the New Testament. We, draw, we drew different um, comparisons for our own life and all. But as we looked at this ritual impurity that arose from matters relating to animals, we grabbed those principles and said, let's take a look how that applies to us, remember. And we saw the cloven hoofed animal that was considered to be clean if that cloven hoofed animal also chewed the cud. And we said, you know, as a, as a reminder for us today that we too need to have those principles in our life. A divided walk, a cloven hoof walk, if you will. We have to have that divided walk. We have to walk differently from those in the world. There needs to be a walk that matches our commitment to follow Christ. And then we talked about chewing the cud, and we went to how a cow chews the cud and brings up his food from one stomach to the next stomach to the next stomach, brings up his mouth, chews it, swallows it down, regurgitates it back up, catches it, chews it, swallows it back down. We talked about all that, and we said, so too a believer should be doing that very same thing, remember, with the Word of God. Taking the Word of God, swallowing it down, and then throughout the day, regurgitating the Word of God back up and ruminating on it, meditating on it, spending time in the Word as we just Think about what it was we read. Now, unfortunately, there are far too many, in quote, and I use big, in quote, Christians who don't read the Bible every day. And that is just an embarrassment, isn't it? That's just an embarrassment. I know we're real busy and all. And you know, to read the Word does take anywhere from three to five minutes. I understand. But what an embarrassment to call ourselves, well, I, I'm a Christian. I just don't want to give God time to speak to me. I just go to church and let pastor tell me what God's word says. Shame on us, right? Shame on us. So we saw the divided walk and the chewing of the cud, the meditating on the word of God in chapter 11. And then we saw that God says, so be holy, be different, be separated, because I'm holy, God said. And we talked about the clean glove in the mud puddle. And how to take a white glove and put it on your hand and stick it in the mud puddle. The mud puddle does not become all glovey. But the glove will certainly become all muddy. And how important it is for us to realize that we cannot be hanging in dirtiness expecting to remain clean. Clean does not make dirty clean, but dirty definitely makes clean dirty. So we want to be careful with that. We saw that the Word of God says that creeping things will defile you. And we said, man, you're hanging off creeps, you're going to get defiled. Simple as that. <laughs> and if you are a creep, you're going to be defiling others. We, we saw that, remember. <laughs> we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, that we are compared to be earthen vessels. And we saw in Leviticus chapter 11, that if an earthen vessel was unclean, it would be broken. 
And we said, if we think that we can just handle being in an unclean state, I don't care if I'm a little bit dirty. Jesus died for my sins. Be ready to be broken, because God loves you. And he will bring a brokenness to you to help you repent to come back to him. And if we can be an earthen vessel in a state of uncleanness without the breaking of God, that's probably evidence that we're not one of his yet. So if you're in a state of sin right now, and so I'm, God's going to be letting you get by with it, I would encourage you to become born again today. Going to church does not save you, but placing your faith in Jesus Christ for the world is. So I want to encourage you today, throughout this service, if you feel that, well, shoot, I'm, I'm getting by with my sin, you're probably not his kids. You need to. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. I'm not going to say who that is. <laughs> My back is old Johnson. But that's a cool little ring. <laughs> so we looked at that, and we saw the importance of being holy, being separate, not thinking we can somehow be in the world without being of the world if we do not have a divided walk, if we are not in the world. Then we also saw at the very end, remember, that if you brought something unclean and you brought it into a running cistern, a running water, that water would not become unclean. And we looked at Jesus, who he called himself that living water, that running water. And we said there's no amount of uncleanness any of us can bring to Jesus that he cannot clean. That's the only way we're ever going to get clean, is bringing our sin to Christ. That's it. So we looked at that in chapter 11 the past two weeks. Now as we get into chapter 12, and chapter 13, and chapter 14, and chapter 15, these four chapters go together. And they all deal not with contamination, uncleanness, a state of ceremonially being unclean, or ritual uncleanness that comes from touching an animal, eating an animal. But it deals with the uncleanness, the ritual impurity that happens when something happens with our body. If something comes out of our body, or if something grows inside our body. And that's what chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15 deal with. The ritual impurity. Now realize this is ritual impurity. And it's a foreign concept for us as Christians because we're not dealing with ritual impurities. So again, we want to just go back and look at that one more time to make sure we understand what this clean and unclean state is. Remember, God said there were three states. There was the unclean, the clean, and the holy. Three states. And we saw as we went back into that, back as we started getting into chapter 11, that the holy was that which was separated to God. In Judaism, in the wilderness wanderings, it would have been the priests, the high priests. They were set apart for full-time service to God. They would have been holy. They were different. They were set apart. They were sanctified. They were, they were holy. Then there was the body of the children of Israel that would be clean. And as long as they were clean, they could enter into the tabernacle area. Not inside the tabernacle, but the tabernacle area. And they could be part of the public worship services and the festivals that took place throughout the year, the Passovers, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the the Feast of Pentecost, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets, they could be part of that, as long as they were clean. And if they were not clean ceremonially, they were considered to be unclean, outside the camp. Not allowed to come into the presence of God, His priests, or His people that are worshiping God. So unclean, clean, and holy. And then God said, here's how you can tell if you're clean or not. Here are certain requirements. Bum, 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 bum. You do this, you're clean. You don't do this, you're unclean. Simple as that. Why these things? Because God said, that's why. God said, don't do that. As time has gone on, we've seen the wisdom in a lot of the things that God put into the law. It's like, whoa, that's awesome. He says, don't eat pork. You ever had a piece of undercooked pork? You understand that. <coughs> he says, don't eat this. Don't eat that. 
And then we get into modern day medical science nutrition classes and we find out that, wow, that's a pretty healthy diet God gave these people out there. It's not a salvation issue. He just says, do this. You'll feel better. You'll be healthier. And you'll be ritually clean because you're listening to me. Why do we do it? Because God said that's it. So that's the clean, the unclean, and the whole. Well, now in chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15, the Lord gives the children of Israel different things that will make them unclean. And it's all based on their body. In chapters 12 and 15, we're going to see is what comes out of your body can make you unclean. Chapters 13 and 14, what happens from within your body can make you unclean. So today we look at chapter 12, and we're going to see that it's the impurity <coughs> that results from the loss of bodily fluids. Now, as this is put together in the book of Leviticus by Moses, as God is speaking to him, it's put together in something, and this is one of those words, you just file away in your memory, because it's a cool word. It's, I'm going to pronounce it chiasm. C-H-I-A-S-M. Just a cool word, chiasm. And what it is, it's a Hebrew literary device you're going to see throughout the Old Testament. They use it all the time. And it's kind of fun, but what it does is it helps you get the right meaning of a passage, a group of, of texts. A chiasm in Hebrew, what they would do is they'd say, this is the first part of this group, this is the last part of this group, this is the middle part, and the first part and the last part are going to mirror each other. It's a chiasm. It's what they do. So they'll say something, they'll say something else, and then they'll re-say something over here, or say something else in the same way they said it with the first one. This is the bookend. We talk about bookends over and over and over in the Old Testament studies. These bookends. It's a Hebrew chiasm, a literary device they do all the time. Chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15, chiasm. Chapter 12, uncleanness that results from the emission of body fluids. That's what it is. Chapter 15, uncleanness that results from the emission of body fluids. That's what it is. There's the bookends. In between, chapters 13 and 14, uncleanness, impurity that results from what comes from within and goes out on the surface of the skin. It doesn't leave the body, it just sits on it, i.e. leprosy. So that's what we're going to be looking at during the Christmas season. <laughs> this is awesome. Here we go. Here we go. So here we are. Chapter 12. In giving birth to a baby, as you know, moms will experience a measure of bleeding and the loss of other fluids. When that would happen, based on God's word that he gave to the children of Israel, that mother became ceremonially, ritually unclean. Chapter 12 deals with, so what do we do to bring her back to being clean? What is the purification rite? What is the purification process for a woman who has had a child? As we look at chapter 12, it's really important, guys, and this is extremely important. I believe this is where a lot of uh, times people get a whacked perspective on what God thinks of sex, pregnancy, and children. They can get really whacked here if we're not careful, so we want to pay extreme close attention to what is being taught here. Because nothing in Leviticus 12, nothing should ever be interpreted to teach that somehow human sexuality is dirty. Far from the truth. Nothing in here is, is being taught that pregnancy is somehow defiling. Nothing could be further from it. And nothing here is taught that babies are impure, or, or children are, are a bad thing. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, and you know this story, where it says there that God created them, male and female, he created them. And a couple of verses later, he says, be fruitful and multiply. God created a man and a woman, and he says, be fruitful, multiply, have more children. Right from the very beginning. And then it says in verse 31 of chapter 1 of Genesis, and God looked at all of creation. And he didn't say it was good. He said it was good after every day. He created the first day it was good, second day it was good, the third day it was good, the fourth day it was good, the fifth day it was good. And now he says this, be fruitful and multiply. He said, male, female, be fruitful and multiply. And he looks and he doesn't say it was good. He says it was 
Very good. Very good. <laughs> Even better than good. That was very good. And what I love about that, he said that before Adam and Eve had children. So those of you that are here that have no children, so we don't have a family, you have a family. Husband and wife is very good in God's eyes. That's very good. Children are added blessings to an already great thing, and that is a husband and wife loving the Lord and following God together. And children are a blessing. Even though in our modern society, <laughs> large families are often looked at almost with disdain. I had a friend, he was my sound man up in Santa Fe for the first service. For how many years was Todd up there, Sid? A long time. Ten years, maybe? Ten, eleven years. He just did the first service sound. That's what we, we had a professional sound man, Jody, but then Todd did the first service. Just did it. When I met Todd, his wife was pregnant with their third baby. And it was like sweet. And then the next year she was pregnant with her fourth baby. And the next year she was pregnant with their fifth baby. And the next year she was pregnant with their sixth baby. And the next year she was pregnant with their seventh baby. You know that. And then the next year she was pregnant with their eighth baby. And the next year pregnant with their ninth baby. And the next year she was pregnant with their tenth baby. You know that. The next year they're pregnant with the 11th baby, and the next year pregnant with their 12th baby. Thought of a contractor, built this beautiful home out in El Dorado. Beautiful. She, housed, she homeschooled all these kids. These kids were brilliant kids. They bought a, a van, a 15-passenger van. That was her family. <laughs> and uh, amazing, amazing family. Godly, well-behaved kids. You knew them, right? Were they godly, well-behaved kids? What do you think? Blah, we got here on here. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. You know how it is. They were godly, they were godly kids. Mostly well behaved, but godly kids. <laughs> they were great kids. Great kids. And they all looked, you could tell the family. Remember, they all looked similar. They all had this little reddish, blondish, reddish hair. They were sort of like yours. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's like that. It's sort of like that color hair. It's just, it's just beautiful hair. They all have it. And Taffy, to, uh, Taffy was there, but Taffy, she went by, would take the kids into the grocery store. And it was like a mother duck with a little duck in it. And they were just, they were just and they, could, they looked alike. And they were all behaved kids in the store. And she'd say, you know, Pastor Pat, it's the craziest thing because people will come up to me and say, are all these children yours? And we go, yeah. Ugh. Walk away. One explained to her the importance of knowing about birth control in front of our kids. That's our society today. Our society says, don't raise kids. You better know the enemy was hating that family. Because here were 12 kids being raised to love Jesus. Knowing the word, the importance of fellowship, the importance of just being godly. And doing well. Doing really well. These kids did well. Perfect kids? No. Godly kids, yeah. Definitely. So our society says, yeah, children, I don't know, be careful on that. I can only tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says in Psalm 127, 3, and again in Psalm 128, that a child and children are complete blessings from God. How many children should we have? Well, how many blessings do you want from God? It's up to you. I think you should stop at around 40. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> Have kids, man, that's awesome. It's a joy, it's a privilege, it's awesome. Big families are great. Big families are great. Well, we're going to look at Leviticus 12 now. What happens after one of these children are born? It's not that the kids are bad, it's not that the woman is bad, it's not that the pregnancy is bad. It's that God said, when that happens, you're unclean because there's this emission of bodily fluids. You're unclean for a measure of time. And we're going to see as we look into chapter 12, there's a three stage process. I find it interesting, there's a three stage process. Because throughout the scripture, three is used oftentimes to really underscore something, that this is complete. I think when David and uh, his buddy Jonathan, remember the son of Saul, were just determining what should we do, should I stay here and just hang out with you, Jonathan, or is your dad really going to try and kill me and all? And remember David goes and hides in the, in the rocks, and Jonathan finds out from dad, from Saul, what 
Saul's plan, King Saul's plans are with young David. And he finds out he's going to kill David. So he goes out and he shoots an arrow and sends a guy after the arrow. And they had already talked about this. He says, you know, go further, go further. That would be my way of telling you, David, get out of here, man. My dad's going to kill you. And it says right there, when David hears that in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 41, that David bowed to the ground before Jonathan as a way of, I respect your position, you're my best friend, I'm going to miss you, but he bows down to the ground before Jonathan. But it says he bows down before Jonathan not one time, not two times, but three times. And in the Hebrew scriptures, over and over and over, the number three is that, is that showing that it's completed. It's, it's something that's going to be done. He's, I'm leaving you for good now. I'm bowing, I'm bowing away, I'm, I'm out of here. See you, bye. When Elijah was brought to the widow's son who had died in the upper room, remember, for everybody out, he said he draped himself, he laid on that child's body, crying out to God, but it says he laid on that child's body three times. When God called for Samuel, in the dream of Samuel, the little boy, Samuel, Samuel, <clears throat> three times. Throughout the Old Testament scriptures, we see this three component coming in to underscore the action that was being done. Amen. Well, here now we are going to see the purification of the woman after a tremendous blessing to the family, a tremendous blessing to the world. Another child is born but there's an uncleanness in it. We're going to look at that in just a minute. How does she become clean again? How does this purification take place? It's a three-stage process. The first stage, we'll call it just the initial stage. And we're going to see as we look at it that it's going to last for a period of seven days. Then we're going to look at the second stage, and we're going to see that that's going to last for... 14 days if it's, a, if it's a little baby girl, 7 if it's a boy. And then we're going to look at the third stage, and we're going to see that the mom is going to have to bring some different offerings. So let's take a look at the text, and we'll get into it and uh, see what we can dig in here. Chapter 12, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a, what kind of baby? Yeah. A little boy. If she bore, if it's a little baby boy, if it's a male child, then she shall be unclean, how long? Seven days. Seven days. As in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. Customary impurity. Can you believe we're talking about this on a Sunday morning? <laughs> but in chapter 15 of Leviticus, we are going to see a major section of Scripture dealing with the monthly menstrual cycle of a woman. And how that, that monthly impurity that monthly menstrual cycle, the emission of body fluids from the body, will make the woman unclean for that seven-day period. Unclean in it that she will not be able to go into the presence of God in tabernacle or temple worship. She will not be able to go into fellowship meals like Passover or Pentecost or... Feast of Tabernacle celebrations, she is considered unclean during that time. During that time, there can be no physical relationship with her husband. She is considered unclean. When she is unclean, if she sits on a chair and then gets up, and someone else sits on that chair, he becomes unclean. Now, he will not be able to go into the presence of God because he has become unclean. Uncleanness thing with the customary impurity it's called. We'll be looking at that in great depth later on. The purpose for the uncleanness and why God did that is because you, we'll see as we get into it because of the great love for women. He loves his kids and he knows that women need this period. <coughs> this time alone. Not a time for the husband to be intimate with his wife. This is a time for her to repair and cleanse. So he says here, if a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. Like in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, after that seven days uncleanness, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. We'll be looking at circumcision here in just a little bit. She shall then continue in the blood of her purification 33 days, 33 more days for a total of 40 days. So if it's a little boy that's born, seven days she's considered completely unclean. 
Then we're going to see at the, the eighth day, the little boy is circumcised, and then she has another 33 days of uncleanness. <coughs> she shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her customary impurity. And she shall continue in the blood of her purification, not 33 days, but 66 days. So the uncleanness for the birth of a little girl is double the uncleanness time of the birth of a little boy. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, 40 days for a little boy, 80 days for a little girl, when the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the priest will offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who is born a male or a female. And if she's not able to bring the lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, as one for a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her, and she will be clean. Okay, here we go. That's the text for the day. So we look at this, and if a little boy is born, we've seen now, oh, we've already got the, up there, seven days if the baby is a little boy. And as we look at this, we go to verse 2 now. If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be clean, unclean seven days. In the days of her customary period, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Now, first off, the seven days of uncleanness. Seven is a, a key component in Judaism. The number seven, as you know, is typically related to thoroughness or completeness. So she's got a complete period of time where she has been considered unclean. And now it's a matter of getting ready to transition into another state. And this whole period of purification is transitioning from uncleanness to cleanness. From impurity to purity. Because of the body fluids, the blood and the other body fluids that were lost during the birthing process. It says, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. In Genesis chapter 7, we should probably turn there, or Genesis chapter 17, excuse me, Genesis chapter 17, it tells us there that God is speaking to Abraham, he's entered into that covenant relationship with Abraham, remember now, an unconditional covenant where God says, I'm going to bring your people, your descendants into another land, but I'm going to bring them back out again. Remember he said, I'm also going to be your, your God, and I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. He gives all these promises to Abraham. But in chapter 17, verse 7, he says this, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Verse 11. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Verse 13, he who is born in your house, he who is bought with your money, must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So we see that circumcision was instituted by God for the Jewish people to be a sign of the covenant that he had made with Abraham. There were other nations that uh, had practiced circumcision. But God took that and he said, this will be a sign of the covenant of <coughs> that I made with you. There's a rabbi, his name is Rabbi Yisrael Kotler, and he was asked, well, why the circumcision on the eighth day? And he gives the typical Jewish response. Of, he is, this is uh, current. This is just a recent rabbi's response. He says, in the stereotypical Jewish fashion, allow me please to answer your question why circumcision on the eighth day, through asking yet another question. 
Why can't the Brit, B-R-I-T is the Hebrew word for circumcision, why can't the Brit or circumcision wait until the child grows older? Wouldn't it be much more greater if a mature person using his own intelligence would choose to make the big decision himself? But that's the beauty of a Brit or circumcision. We are born Jews. It is not a project we rationally decide to undertake. Our covenant with, and then they just have the name, is super rational. It does not go away in moments when our minds tell us otherwise. We do not always comprehend the reasons behind the mitzvah. According to Kabbalah, the, mystis, the, the uh, mystical Jewish writings, the number seven represents nature and that which is complete or finite. Seven days in a week, seven days of creation, the seven human faculties. Eight represents the super rational, the infinite, or the new beginning. And those of you that are into numerology know eight would consider the number of new beginnings. The miraculous is opposed to the natural. Belief, faith, is opposed to comprehension. And so, a baby is given his circumcision on the eighth day. And when that happens, he is entering a religion founded upon faith, whose survival is miraculous, whose potential in the world is infinite. Yours truly, Rabbi Yisrael Kola. There it is. So there is the Jewish perspective from the religious significance of the eight-day circumcision. Obviously, they do it because that's what God told them to do it. But here's a Jewish perspective. What I find very interesting is, yes, there is spiritual significance, but there's also physical significance. Extreme physical significance. I've got a long old article. I'm not going to read it, I think. It's not necessary. I think I'll just explain it. But in 1939, medical science discovered something. What they discovered is that blood clots. And that the clotting factors are two. There's vitamin K, of course. And there's another clotting factor called prothrombin. And throw prothrombin and vitamin K together work together as the two clotting factors that bring about the ability for us when we cut ourselves, it clots. Well, in 39, they looked, where does this stuff come from? And they found something really interesting, really interesting. Those of you that have little boys, if you've had them circumcised, you know that when the baby boy is born, they give him a shot of something. Vitamin K. Because your body doesn't start producing vitamin K until your fourth, fifth, sixth day of existence. So a newborn baby is cut or bleeding, and there's no blood clotting factor in there. So you give them the vitamin K, now if something were to happen, it clots. The prothrombin, they don't know why, they just know that's what it is. The body doesn't start producing that until the fifth, sixth, seventh day, somewhere in there. And they don't know why, but on the between the seventh and the ninth days, uh, hello, the eighth day, for whatever reason, the prothrombin level in all humans spikes. 210% of the normal amount of prothrombin that you should have in your body. And then on day 9, it goes down to the 100% level the rest of your life. Vitamin K is needed, and prothrombin is needed for blood clot. How interesting. We finally caught up with God in 1939 and said, oh, that's how that works. But God, in the days of Abraham, said, don't be circumcised in your boys before the eighth day. They'll bleed out. Went to the eighth day, and God made the body in such a way that that is when you have the highest amount of clotting in your body on the eighth day. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? I just don't know how you really trust God. Oh, I mean, that's some serious detail right there. That is serious. God's got this stuff. How many times in our own life we say, well, God, why would you have me do that? I don't know. Shut up. <laughs> Trust God. He's got this. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to show God I love him even more. I love him even more than I will wait till the eighth day. I'm going to dedicate my son to God right now. Day two. Well, go ahead and do that back in Abraham's day, but you'll be seeing God in Brooklyn. <laughs> Obey the word of God. Whether we get it or we don't get it. If we don't get it, it's because we haven't studied enough. That's all. 
The problem is not with the word of God. The problem is not with God. The problem is with me. The problem is with you. Isn't that God? So we see the spiritual significance to a Jew. It's because it represents this journey of faith. The physical significance of the eighth day is that's the best day to circumcise a baby. He's going to clock right now. Now I came across another article. I've never heard this. I'm going to go off to the side again. But I came across an article that said they just recently discovered that the nervous system is developing in a newborn baby. And as it develops, the sensory nerves develop from the top of the head down to the feet. And it takes a couple of weeks. And this guy draws the significance that on the eighth day, the sensory nervous system has not gone all the way down to the loin area yet. So that the circumcision on an eight-year-old little boy would be very, not pain-free, but nothing like it would be on a, on a 25-year-old man. Interesting. I don't know. I'm just putting out this one. Why I couldn't confirm it. I just saw one article on it. So I'm just putting it out there. If you're interested in something like that. Do some research and see if there's anything to that, or is it just some guy going crazy? I don't know. So I'm just putting it out there. But it was interesting in the light of that. I said, well, that's worth following up, but I, I didn't. So at any rate, circumcision, a sign of the covenant, done on the eighth day. Leviticus here reiterates that. He says, that, remember in verse 2, it says, speak to the children of Israel. They were the people of the covenant. This is a law for the people of Israel, those who are under the Abrahamic covenant. And it says in verse 3, And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. When? On the eighth day. Now it goes into verse 4. She shall then continue in the blood of her purification for 33 days. This starts the second stage of this purification process. The 33 days if the baby is a boy. So we have the first stage, the seven-day purification. Then the second stage starts. The first day of that second stage, day eight, the day of new beginnings, the baby is circumcised. And now she starts that second stage of purification that lasts for 33 days. During this time, we see she is prohibited from touching anything holy, anything sacred, and she's not allowed to go to the sanctuary. The Jews, as time went by, said those are the two prohibitions in days 33 and following. And she is no longer considered to be unclean. She sits on something, that's okay. It's just those first seven days. And then after that, it's, she can't touch anything that's sacred, and she can't go into the sanctuary yet. Interesting, where it says she continues, um, yeah, in the middle of verse 4, she shall not touch anything hallowed, nor come into the sanctuary. Those two phrases are emphasized in the Hebrew. Any hallowed thing and sanctuary. Emphasized. Any hallowed thing, she cannot touch. The sanctuary, she cannot go in, is how it reads in the Hebrew. It's really stressed. The importance, you see. Here's something for today now, ready? The importance of respecting the Lord by respecting and honoring things that are associated with His holiness. That's important. That's important. Difficult for me to say this. But I'm, I'm going to say it. Just because I think it's important for the body. It's important for us as Christians today to show respect to things that are associated with the Lord. It's important for us as parents to instill in our children a measure of respect for things that are associated with the Lord. It's important. The Bible is the Bible. If you lose your Bible, uh, it's not like, oh, you lost your Bible. That's a bummer. If it's on Montgomery, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mine ended up in Montgomery. But, but if you lose your Bible, if you set something on the Bible, and you put a cup of coffee on the Bible, there are those from old schools that have, ooh, that's not good. But it's just a book. But when you open it up and you read that book, this becomes God speaking to you. So when the Word of God is being read at home, children are expected to listen. It's God's Word. A respect should be given to the Word of God. 
not making this an object of worship, but the God of this Bible. That's the object of worship. And he speaks to us through this. Now, a lot of you know me. And those of you who know me well, you just kind of go, oh, man, here we go. It's just me. One of my many light verses is God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That'd be me. I mean, shh. I have been thoroughly blessed in my life. I have parents who have raised me and loved me still. I have a wife who fell in love with Jesus and loves me. What's better than that? I have children. I have grandchildren. I have brothers and sisters. Hello. My life's pretty stinking good right now. And they all love me. They know me and they love me anyway. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So I'm blessed. Beyond my wildest imagination, I'm blessed. And then God gave me the opportunity to serve once again in the role of a teaching pastor. What? I can't even believe that. Personally, I'm me. I hang out, I'm just me. But I think it's important that we teach our children, specifically now, in this generation, to have respect for the pastor. The position of the pastor. Not for me, but for the role that God has put me in. When I leave, another pastor comes in for that same position. When he leaves other comes into that same position. And when you move, you go to that position. It's the position, not the person. Please get that. But I am convinced that there are certain things that we should be teaching our children. Now, if we don't respect the position of the pastor ourselves, our children are going to. The children just are a reflection of what's really going on when you're not here. So I don't make a big deal of it. I just know, no, kids aren't respecting I understand. <laughs> okay. One of the things, James, you're, you can see me right in that camera right now, can't you? <laughs> James is doing the videoing. He's in the other room videoing, but I'm, I'm looking right at you, putting in that camera. <laughs> James is the camera guy in the back right now. He's got a little boy. And it's been amazing to see this little boy grow up and what's being instilled in that little boy. Elijah comes up to me immediately. I hear it from his dad. Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you, sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. Dad or his mom, say hi to Pastor. Now, my life is going to be really good if this little guy calls me Pastor or not. I'm going to be fine. I'm not going to go, oh, I can't believe why you can call me Pastor. It's not about me. It's about that little boy. Because that little boy starting to learn, I should respect my pastor. Why? Oh, because he teaches us the word of God. And God is really amazing. That's just good parenting. James, way to go. Mom, way to go. That's just smart. That's just raising up children in the way they should go. That's just what you want to do. It's not about me. I don't care. I don't care. I care about the kids. And what that does in a little guy for the rest of his life. <coughs> now, if we as adults show the same respect for the office, for the office, what do you suppose that's going to do for some of the kids that aren't getting that? It's going to, it's going to start to happen. People follow by example. What drives me crazy is when my wife calls me Pastor Carl. <laughs> she has done that. 
in her prayers are talking to the body. And our pastor. And I go, no, no, don't call me your pastor. We have a much closer relationship than a pastor. I'm your husband. And a husband and wife is much closer than a pastor. So don't go down, I'm your husband. But the pastor, the position of pastor should be honored and respected. Not me. The office. The office. So we want to help all the families with their children by just helping them see the position. It's so very, very important. Very important. So we got off on that, but I, I had to address that because I've been seeing the fruit of it in a number of families. I just used James because he's on the camera. He's not here, so we, we won't see his red face on top. <laughs> but um, I know a lot of you are doing that, and uh, God bless you for doing that. We'll see what happens. It's not about me, it's the position. That's the key thing. It's the position. So when we talk about that position in a derogatory way at home, and our children hear it, realize what you're doing to your children. Don't let you hear things. So just be wise. Be wise. At <clears throat> any rate, we take a look now at Leviticus chapter 11. And we see that this time of impurity, or 12, excuse me, 12, this time of impurity goes on for another 33 days, a total of 40 days. Seven in Hebrew, a number of completeness. 40 in Hebrew, interestingly enough, two, two means to 40, judgment, but also thoroughness or completeness. God reigned 40 days and 40 nights. In the days of Noah, judgment on the world and a complete judgment on the world. The children of Israel were sent out to they sent spies into the promised land. They were gone for 40 days. It was a complete survey of the promised land. Jesus was tempted for, for or he was in the wilderness when he was tempted, 40 days. Completeness again. Now we see seven and a total of 40 in the Hebrew text. The Hebrew folks that are reading this go, whoa, this is a complete purification. This is amazing. It's completely purified. Now mom and son have gone through this weight. They're ready to transition now from the impure into the pure ritual status. Then in verse 5, but if she, if she bears a female child, then she will be unclean, not for one week, but two weeks, as is in her customary purity, and she shall continue the blood of her purification 66 days. So now, all of a sudden, everything is doubled. And there is absolutely no rhyme or reason that has ever been come up for, the, for that. I've, I've read all kinds of things, and it's like, oh, yes, get off of it. And uh, most of it is written kind of by sexist, chauvinist guys. You can about imagine some of the stuff I read. And it's like, oh, are you serious? Are you serious? What I did notice is there's no mention of circumcision. <coughs> So the male is circumcised. In Genesis 17.10, God tells Abraham, every male child, zekar in the Hebrew, every male child you shall circumcise. Do not circumcise the female. There are many cultures today that have female circumcision, as you know. Uh, in the Muslim communities, in, in some of the Muslim music, they still practice female circumcision. Uh, it's, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. The medical ramifications are ridiculous. Not only does it completely remove any of the sensation for the rest of your life, but it also has been linked to increased pelvic infections, UTIs, hemorrhaging, difficulties during childbirth for both the mom and the baby. And God in his wisdom says, circumcise only well, what about the females? Are they part of the covenant? Most definitely. In Judaism, as you know, the man was the head of the family. The father was the head of the family. He entered into a covenant. The whole family is in part of that covenant. So, yes, still part of the covenant. And then, of course, like we said, the length of impurity is doubled. Why? Who knows? Some have said, well, it's because the male was circumcised on the eighth day, 
in the shedding of that blood reduced the impurity status of the mom by two. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't say that, so I don't know. I, just, I don't know. Others have said, well, remember that the Jewish people don't eat certain portions of meat from the thigh of an animal because Jacob wrestled with God and limped and it became traditions. That was just Jewish tradition, so that's just what it was. It was just double. Nobody knows why we just do it. Well, at least maybe. But I'm of the position, God said it. That's why. God just said it. That's why. There have been those that have said, well, you need to understand that in Judaism, the birth of a son was really a big deal. The birth of a girl was like, poor thing. In fact, as time went on, you'd bring gifts to the birth of a baby. And if it was a boy, there'd be a big celebration with the dad and with all the family members, except for mom, she's unclean, of course. But everybody else had this big party. But if it was a girl, the party was canceled, took your gift, and went home with it. <laughs> Better like next time. That's how a birth of a girl was greeted in Judaism. The 80 days to, for the mom to bond with the baby was required just because of the disappointment of it not being born. <laughs> Others, that's just tradition. And that tradition that they gave an example that I read doesn't even apply to New Mexico. It did, it did apply to Minnesota. It doesn't apply down here. But they, they, they said for tradition, and, and they said it's sort of like the American tradition that when you enter a room, you take off your hat. You just expect to do it. We don't do that in New Mexico. Hat, hat, Kurt has his hat, John's got his hat. That's not part of our tradition. In Minnesota, oh my word. You had better not have a hat going in that house, or you'll get hit upside the head. John hat. The US we don't have that. Up there we have that. It's just, just, just different traditions. Different. They say maybe it's just tradition. Who knows? Who knows? It's just tradition. It's just tradition. Who knows? What we do know is twice as long. That's what we do there. And then we get to the third stage. In the third stage, it says when the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether it's a total of 40 days, 7 and 33 for a boy, of 80 days, 14 and 66 for a girl, when those days of her purification are fulfilled. So for a boy, how long does it take to fulfill the days of purification? 40. Keep that in mind. Okay, it's going to become very significant as a Christian. Keep that in mind. 40. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether it's a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or turtle of as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. In practice in Judaism, they always brought the sin offering first. So they bring the bird, they bring the lamb, there you are. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. And once that happens, <coughs> then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who has borne a male or a female. So it's done. You've had your 40 days for the boy or your 80 days for the girl. And it's like, phew, we've completed the law of purification according to the law of Moses. Let's go and offer the two sacrifices and we're good to go and I can go back to church facing. I can get back involved. So they do that. <coughs> and as they do that, they look and they go, we don't have the money for a land. Notice the last verse. If you don't have the ability to bring a lamb for that burnt offering, you can bring either two young pigeons or two young turtle doves instead of a turtle dove, a young pigeon, and a lamb. So just bring, if you're poor and you can't handle it, just bring that, it's okay. You offer that and it's finished. So why is that significant to us as a Christian? Let's go into the Gospel of Luke. In chapter 2, verse 21. We read it this morning, and I'm sure you read it. We read it twice this morning, once without a mic and once with a mic. 
You're going like, why are you reading this verse? We're in Leviticus and oh Christmas, maybe it must be Christmas. <laughs> Oh, 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 bless you. That's one of the many reasons I love you, man. I'm dying. <laughs> That's it. That was old Mike Hartfield had to bring me some water. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we look at chapter 2 of Luke. Verse 21. Jesus has been born, remember. And then it says in verse 21, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child. Now that makes sense, right? Eight days, that's the day you circumcised the baby. So when the eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. Hebrew tradition was you always named your child on the day of his circumcision. That's when he got his name. Take a look, if you would, in, um, now that I said that, I hope I've got that. Yeah, uh, verse 59 of chapter 1. 59 of chapter 1. There gave the birth of John the Baptist. And it says in verse 59, speaking of John the Baptist, so it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father Zacharias. His mother says no, his name should be called John. There it is again. Circumcision on the eighth day, naming of the child on the day of the circumcision. So we start to see that a little bit. Tradition and the Old Testament law Reiterated here in Leviticus chapter 12 from Genesis chapter 17, a sign of the covenant. Everybody got that so far? We're pretty much set on that. Okay. Now, his name was called Jesus, it says in chapter 2, verse 21 of Luke. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Verse 22. Now, when the days of Mary, of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed... Whoa! How many times have you been read that? How many days was it? Forty days. Sure. When the days of his purification, according to the law of Moses, were complete, that's forty days. So forty days after his birth, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law. Mary went through the, the, the days of her purification, when the law of Moses were completed. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male opens the womb should be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. There it is. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's where that comes from. It comes from Leviticus chapter 12. Do you see that? What does that tell us about Mary and Joseph? They were poor. Wait a minute. I thought the Magi brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They blow it in 40 days? What's up? What does that tell us? They haven't been there yet. That's what it tells us. That's another of the many places we see where we look at the nativity scenes in the, in the, uh, in the mall. They're all whack. They've got a wooden, wooden barn. There were no wooden barns in Israel. Those who went to Israel with us this last trip, we saw them in the cave in Bethlehem. There was the cave. We saw all of that. And the manger wasn't a little wooden thing. They didn't do that. They had a stone that they hollowed out for a feeding trough. You can still see them today. They have all over the place. Mangers. They're stone feeding troughs. <coughs> and we always put the wise men there. How many wise men do we usually put there? Three. How many wise men were there? Three. We don't have a clue. We don't know. We know they travel in a pack. We know that. They brought three gifts. We know that. We don't know how many wise men there were. So there, maybe there was three. Maybe there was 500. More likely 500. But whatever it was, that's what it was. There were some wise men. But they weren't there in the wooden manger. They weren't even there. <coughs> so we always say, if you buy the wooden manger, if you want to be biblically accurate, and you want to use the American style of the manger, that's fine. But at least take the, th the three wise men. And just, if you, if you live like we live on Eubank and, and Montgomery, if you want to be accurate, have your thing set up at your home, but take the three wise men and bring them over like on the west side. <laughs> they're, coming they're coming. They're going to be coming eventually. They're just not here yet. They're many days out. Well, they usually rode, they usually, they usually rode horses. Isn't that crazy? I thought they had donkeys. They, they usually rode horses. Isn't that something? But we put them on camels because it looks cool. But Magi usually were horse riders. So. so there it is. And, and here they came. So, 40 days after the fact, Mary and Joseph don't have enough money put together to get a land. Isn't that interesting? 
So they show up with their two birds. They follow, but no lamb. But now, and this is so speculative now, because I know I've already messed with some of you already. What are you talking about they weren't there? What are you talking about they weren't there? When I saw it down with diligence, would you? You know, I understand I'm messing with you right now, but I'm just telling you this is what it is. You know, we've Americanized it a lot, and that's how we grew up with it, so that's what it is. So I'm not saying anything. That, I just want you to look at something in the text that I discovered yesterday, actually last night, and it, it kind of, it's twisted me a little bit. It's like, I got that long brain thing again, you know, where you take like fishing line, wrap it around your brain, it's just tightened. When I, when I came across this, I go, no. So I looked at it in the scriptures and I go, hmm. So I'm not saying, I'm just saying. So I'm moving away from the pulpit, and I'm going to challenge you, just if it intrigues you, look at it this Christmas season. See what you think. Just see what you think. I don't know. But take a look at chapter 2, verse 22. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, verse 24, and to offer the sacrifice to what is said in the law of the Lord, this pair of turtle doves, two young pigeons, they fulfill the law of Moses. Do you see that? And while they're doing that, then Simeon sees, you know, he sees the baby, he goes, oh, that's the Messiah. And Anna, the prophetess, sees it. She goes, whoa, this is amazing. You see all that, right? Then take a look at verse 39. Now, I have read the Christmas story. I'm going to guess in my life probably what? I'm 59. <coughs> I've been in ministry for a long time. I'm going to guess I've read Luke 2, maybe in my life what? 800 times, maybe? 1,000 times? A long time. A lot of times. I've never picked up on this. But look at verse 39. So when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord. When was that that they performed all the things according to the law of the Lord? What day was it? 40 days. What do they do? What? They returned to Galilee. To their own city, Nazareth. That doesn't coincide with anything I've ever been taught in Sunday school or anything I've ever put in my head. And immediately my mind starts objecting to this big time. That's why I'm over here. I'm not at a pulpit, I'm just saying. I'm just sharing with one guy shared with me. Well, you know, I'm reading, but <laughs> and when I read, I always picture like a conversation. But at any rate, so that. But when they had performed all the things from the law of the Lord, they just did that there. It was 40 days. They returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The wise men went to Bethlehem. Where did they? Let's take a look at Matthew. This is where the mind bending comes. Get ready. Bend that baby, bend that baby. And I could be wrong. I'm just saying what I've read, that's all. I'm the, the teaching on Leviticus is over. This is just something to look at. <laughs> the only reason I'm sharing this with you is I want to show us the importance of reading the Word of God for what the Word of God says, not for what we think it says. Read the Word of God for what it says. But take a look in the Gospel of Matthew. Verse 1. Or chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the days of Judea, or uh, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, Well, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. Is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Micah 5 2. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Then Herod, when he had secretly called these wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the young child. Interesting, the word young child there is not baby. In the Greek, it's a toddler. Translated like toddler, young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. 
Now those of you who did go to Israel were in Jerusalem. We say, today we're going to Bethlehem. Pack a lunch. It's going to be a long bus trip from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Hang on. We get on the bus, and about eight minutes later we get off the bus, and there's Bethlehem. <laughs> Bethlehem is closer to Jerusalem than Rio Rancho is to here. If I'm in Jerusalem right here, Bethlehem is where I live, or how I live. It's just five miles down the road. It's right there. It's really close. So when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And the point being, isn't it interesting? Bethlehem's right there. Go. There's one road, Jerusalem to Bethlehem. First stop, that's Bethlehem. And yet it says they follow the star. It's just interesting. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the what now? House. Now, Joseph and Mary are dirt poor, number one, two birds. They went to Bethlehem. They're looking for a place to stay. They had to stay in a stable. They're dirt poor at 40 days. And now they're back in the house, which we know they had a house in Nazareth. So it's just putting it out there. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's what it is. I'm just saying, you might expand your mind a little bit. You might search the scriptures. You might look at it. Last night I woke up at 2.10 in the morning. Right? 2.10. 2.10. And I'm like, thinking about this because it's just in my head. It's like, this can't be. This is crazy. I'm not going to tell you. I told Connie last night, I'm not going to teach that. Yeah. People are going to be crazy to teach something like that. So I'm not teaching it. I'm just sharing. <laughs> something I found interesting. But as I was sitting there thinking, well, there's got to be more to it than that. That's just... <laughs> and I don't know how in the world the flight to Egypt fits in. So, those of you that read it, do you think? I don't know. I don't know. But at any rate, I want to give you something that would make you think a little bit besides the purification rites of a woman after you have a child. <laughs> so, hopefully you'll think on that too. So as we look at chapter 12, what we get out of that is we see that Jesus fulfilled the law and that he was circumcised on the eighth day. We see that Mary was in a state of ritual uncleanness until the 40th day, at the end of the 40th day. She brought her sacrifice to the Lord, and we do know that Joseph and Mary at that time were poor. We know that. We know that. We know that. So that's what we're going to grasp from that. So now when you read the Christmas story to your family, which I know most of you probably do, when you have Christmas, don't make it about the gifts, make it about the gifts. Christmas is basically a mass for Christ. Put Jesus in there. And I would encourage you men that you would at least read the Christmas story to your family. At least do that. Read the Christmas story to your family. And um, talk to them a little bit about Jesus. You might have family members who don't know the Lord yet. Say, this is what we're going to do from now on to our new tradition. We're going to turn to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to just read the Christmas story on Christmas. <coughs> Was Jesus born on December 25th? No. <laughs> Who knows? Probably not. Probably not. Shepherds in Israel didn't keep their flocks out in December. It's cold. And that's good. But we celebrate on the 25th of December. Why? Because of the pagan holiday, Saturnalia, it was a time when the day started getting longer. We celebrated the days getting longer. And the tradition at the time to celebrate in the Roman Empire, the days got longer as you bring green, 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 green things into the house. As a reminder that spring is coming. So you'd cut down a tree and bring it into the house. And you'd decorate that baby, you'd share gifts with one another. Spring is coming, spring is coming. You'd put mistletoe up there and kiss under the mistletoe, and you'd put holly around the house because spring was coming. Well, then all of a sudden, Christianity in the 4th century, became the official religion of the entire Roman Empire. And everybody celebrated Saturday night. Everybody. But now, Christianity is the official religion. And we can't be celebrating this false god and all this stuff. This is crazy. And really? You're going to go tell the merchants that they can't have their Saturday sales? They have Black Thursday every year. At least we should buy it. And, and, what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to hit the economy that way? You're going to tell little kids they can't have Saturnalia gifts? Really? 
and people get take off, they have Saturnalia vacations, you're going to tell the school they can't have Saturnalia vacations, are you serious? You've got to do something. They said, well, it's a celebration of the coming of the sun. The sun's coming in the spring. Days are getting longer. Let's celebrate the coming of the SON. We'll celebrate the greatest gift that was ever given, a light into the darkness. We'll celebrate Jesus. We'll have a big old service for Christ. We'll call it a Christ Mass, or Christmas. So then I have found Christians, oh, I don't celebrate Christmas because you know Saturnalia. I'm not worshiping no Saturnalia, I'm worshiping Jesus. And I'm going to worship Jesus. Well, I don't put a Christmas tree up because, you know, they, and Jeremiah says that people are cutting down Christmas trees on the hills and putting them in the, putting them in the house and they start worshiping those trees. I don't worship that tree. I don't even like it. I don't worship that tree. But if that is what we're doing, if we're worshiping that tree, well, praise God, because in January, we have the biggest reunion in the United States every year. We take these things, objects of worship, and we throw them in the garbage and burn them. <laughs> so, I mean, let's get real. Let's get real. Now, if you just don't like the emphasis on all the gifts and all the food and all the nostalgia, I don't like that. Well, I just I don't like that. And if you say that, you're in my camp. I don't like it either. I get that from my dad. Thanks, Dad. But <laughs> I'm just, we're, I'm not into Christmas. And I'm really a woman who thinks it's awesome. <laughs> so she has slowly gotten me to tolerate Christmas things. But um, I, I don't go crazy on it. You do. I don't know. And then God brought us our youngest daughter who thinks it's awesome. She's never had an opportunity to decorate trees and all that kind of stuff. So, so now my wife and my youngest daughter, they, they do that. And they have a blast. And, I love it. It's awesome. So don't make that the focal point. The focal point is not the tree having it or not having it. If you come to our home, we're going to have a tree. Are we worshiping the tree? Not even a little bit. We have it. If that really offends you, don't come over. <laughs> That's our home. We have a tree. It's all right. If you do come over, we're going to have a tree. Simple as that. We're going to have it. So if you have a tree, great. If you have a tree, great. Whatever. That's not the issue. The issue is Jesus. That's the issue. It's a Christ mass. It's all about Jesus. So we're going to respect him. That's what we got. People are going to ask, are we going to do Christmas carols? Maybe. That's up to uh, Kurt and I. We'll pray on that. We'll be a lot of them, I'll guarantee you, because I'm a Christmas humbug type of guy. And, um... You know that. <laughs> so that's what it is. Uh, to me, Christmas carols are fine in a nostalgic setting. We're going to do the evening service of Christmas carols. Everyone knows what you're getting into. Then great, let's come and do it. But if I'm coming to worship Jesus and I'm singing jingle bells, that doesn't do it for me. It's nostalgia. I like the feeling, but it's the feeling of Jesus. So it's got to have Jesus in it if you're going to be able to worship song. Speaking of Christmas concerts, I talked to Ludmila Litansky over in Sofia, Bulgaria yesterday, last night. And they had a Christmas concert. And for the Bulgarians, you got to realize they were under communism for years, so Christmas was not celebrated. And now they can. So they had it in their sanctuary, the new one, which does not have a certificate of occupancy yet. It seats about 500 people. They had over 700 people show up. They had all these people everywhere, just sort of like when we were there, that, just like that. It was like <laughs> crazy. So there it is. I said, I talked to him just, I called him, he wasn't answering, his phone was off, which isn't like him, and then he called me back. And he says, Colin, we had the Christmas concerts. Oh, how did that go? Oh, Colin, it was fantastic. 700 people, over 700 people, had people standing outside the doors. It was amazing. They were worshiping, they can they, can they play? Yeah, they can play. Yeah, they can play a good fire. So it was their worship team and solos and all this stuff. He says, but Colin, the mayor of Sophia came to the concert. That just doesn't, you don't understand, that doesn't happen. Wow. It's a woman, that doesn't happen either, that's amazing. So the, the female mayor of Sofia showed up at the concert. He says, and people saw her, I saw her, like, oh my word. Mayor's in the house. And there she was. She sat, he said, she sat about five rows from the front. She loved it. God, it was amazing. And then he dropped the bomb. And not only he's all excited, not only that, 
that the zoning inspector was there too. And I'm like, I don't know. But, but they, they were really nice. They, they treated me really nicely. And I'm going, uh, so we might need to go to Bulgaria quick and get some air conditioning. I don't know. But it's like, cool. But at any rate, he was so ecstatic. He says, but my youngest son, Stefan, invited his friend about three months ago, and his friend came to Christ. So now he's been coming to the church, and his mom, the Bulgarian mom, is freaking out. What's my son gotten into? Some kind of cult? Some kind of sect? Who knows what this is? So she is freaking out with her son, going to church all the time. He fell in love with Jesus. And there he is. Mom, please come to the Christmas concert. I will go and see how it she went there. Guess who she saw sitting on the fifth row? It's the mayor. Who she is madly, strongly, a strong supporter for her. The mayor comes to this church. <laughs> she was there tonight. Well, I'm glad you're here, son. Now that she's the church. So you know how well, things like that can just kind of he was very sad. Very, he was up high. So they went out celebrating after the concert. They went across the street from the church to that little place that you and I ate a number of times. You remember the name of that little place? The fast food place? Oh, McDonald's. 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 <laughs> <laughs> they went to McDonald's. And it's so funny because Ludmill is working out and trying to be all healthy. And he said, I said, where are you? You're not going He says, oh, Con, I'm being bad, but I'm so happy I don't care. Because I got my entire family, we were celebrating at fantastic concert. I took them out to McDonald's. <laughs> 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 That's a little good man. He's all, good. all I have to say, um, please continue to pray for Bulgaria. Please continue to pray. There's been a number of you that have shown an interest in maybe going to Bulgaria uh, next year. And... Um, if that is in your heart, or if you just want information on it, we'll be meeting today at 12.15. That's a half hour from right now. Right here. Right in this chair, right here. Tito's right there. there are Tito's. So if you're interested in going to Bulgaria or checking out to see what's going on with Bulgaria, um, feel free to come by at 12.15. It'll last about 10 minutes. Won't be long. Just a quick little break. So, there we are. The purification rites of a woman who has just given birth to a child. Circumcision takes place on the eighth day. Spiritual significance to the Jew, physical significance to a human. To a Christian, absolutely zero significance. Other than Jesus fulfilled the law. Circumcision, it was determined early on in the church that it was neither here nor there for a follower of Jesus Christ. So we just kind of went back into the law today and grabbed that out. And we saw that Mary finished the days of her purification, 40 days for the birth of the Son. We see that after that was finished, according to the Gospel of Luke, they went back up to Nazareth. Where the Magi fit in there, that's up to you. We know those things are for Heavenly Father, thank you again for the time just to spend the word here. So we walk through the book of Leviticus. Ooh, we'll look at the channel. Thank you for that. God, I pray that as we leave today, we will just see the wisdom of our God. Even in the minute details of the circumcision of the little baby. The way you made us, we understand that scripture that says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And what a great confidence it is for us when we go through medical issues, knowing that even something that minute, Lord, you have it under control, it gives us such great confidence that we come into physical ailments and things, Lord, knowing that you know what's up. And we trust you in that. Well, thanks for being so good to us. Thank you for every work, every job, every kid in your work. And even today, a scripture like this can be used by the people who have to increase our faith in you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Tonight at 6.30 we have a communion night. Next week at 4.30 we have a big event. Huge event. Most of you are aware of it. It's a big one. It's Christmas, coffee, dessert, and lemonade, and fun, and fellowship in the fellowship hall, 4.30 to 6.30. Is that right? More or less. More or less. More or less. More or less. That is correct? 4.30. Okay, 4.30. Those of you who join us next week, God bless you guys, you'll stand up, see you tonight at 6.30.